I have forgotten what snow looked like. And so literally what I did, I actually uh, turned and face outside as I saw the snow falling and it looked beautiful. I know it probably only looks beautiful for the first day. After that, uh, it gets really, really annoying. But uh, it is great to be here. Uh, it is so much better to worship God when your wife is with you. And I'm glad that she's here. And um, you know, like I said last Wednesday, that there is the best part of me, without a doubt. My wife is the very, very best part of me, and I'm thrilled to be able to worship God here with her. Um, uh, Melanie's mom, and my mom uh, as well, actually, Melanie's mom uh, has uh, moved from, from St. Catharines, Toronto, their area, and is moving to the Ottawa Church. She is a disciple. We want to welcome her to the congregation here, Mom. It's good to have you. Amen. So let's continue in our series, and one of the things that we wanted to focus on here uh, in the Ottawa Church is that we were going to look heavenward and focus on God for the next few months, specifically some attributes about God that helps us to deepen our faith in who He is, what He is, ultimately, and we can trust Him even more. Last week we talked about the idea that God is incomprehensible. That while we may know aspects of Him, we may not know Him completely and utterly. Because if that's the case, then He would cease to be God. But that there's always a striving. And the idea that God is in one sense so wonderful, so incomprehensible, ought to drive us to our knees and to say, our God is awesome. He's filled with incredible, incredible aspects that helps us to draw even closer to Him and to dig deeper and to find out indeed who our God is. And so the idea that God is incomprehensible helps us to actually fall on our knees. Today we're going to talk about another aspect about God that prayerfully will leave us in awe again as we continue to understand who this great God is. And that is the incomparable God. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 40, we, we read about God. Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 12. Are we all right? It says in verse 12 to 14. And this morning I'm going to switch in between um, some versions, but like I said, it keeps us on our toes a little bit. God is talking, and, and the scriptures actually is talking about who God is. And it says, Who has measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand? or carefully measured the sky. The idea here is that God is so incredible that the seas, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, all the waters literally can be measured in His hands. I mean, I want you to think about that for a second. It's incredible. Or carefully weighed the soil of the, of the earth, or weighed the mountains in the balance, or the, or the hills of the scales. Who comprehends the mind of the Lord or gives him instruction as his counselor? You know, a lot of times when we need help in a certain area of our life, let's say we need some financial help, we'll go to a financial counselor to help us to understand. Or we need, we have some physical issues that we need to go see a doctor. So grateful for Vernon who came and helped me move, uh, putting our stuff in the uh, storage. He's energetic, he's helping, it's all uh, incredible. And then something very bad happened. A very heavy bed fell and it hit him on the leg. And it cut his leg and I looked at it. I, I almost threw up immediately. That's how bad it was. As a matter of fact, <laughs> He had to go to the hospital. Dave took him to the hospital. He needed someone 
to help him out. And I want to say thank you, Vernon. And Vernon, in typical Vernon style, totally did not want the focus of attention to be on him. I'm okay, I'm good, don't worry about me, and all that kind of stuff. And yet, you know, if you've had, literally what the bed did, it literally cut him right here. Had it fallen a little bit, had he stand a little closer to it, it could have been a lot worse. Vernon, we all took it, well, Dave took him to the hospital. He needed attention. We couldn't fix it. As a matter of fact, we were panicking a little bit. What is going on here? If we needed some help in our mental health, we maybe go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist to be able to help us. Someone who is more trained or more educated in an area. I want you to think about this. God does not need a counselor. All of us in some areas of our life, there are gaps in our learning, isn't there? That's why always whenever you go, baby, a Jeopardy or, or Wheel of Fortune, couples generally do better than, 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 than singles. Why? Because there are gaps in, it doesn't matter who you are, there are gaps in your learning. And God, the Bible says, does not need instruction. He does not need a counselor. From whom does he receive directions? These are rhetorical questions. He doesn't receive directions from anyone. For me to get here still, even though it took me about 10 minutes, I needed to put it in the GPS and give me directions to get here. God does not need direction for his life. Who teaches him the correct ways to do things or imparts knowledge to him or instructs him in skillful design? That is our God. Unlike us. Man, we're trying to set up something. We go on Google. Okay, how do we do this? I, we had uh, already installed in our house a wall mount for our TV. If you know anything about me, I'm not a handyman by any stretch of the imagination. And for the longest while, it took us, we Googled it, we went to the store to look like one uh, was just like it. Well, it was not exactly like it. I mean, I needed instructions. I needed directions. I needed guidance. The God that we serve is not lacking in anything. Certainly not in counsel, not in direction, in our lives. And a lot of times, if you're anything like me, especially when I'm going through difficult times, this is what I think. Does God really understand what I'm going through? Does he really understand the intricacies of my challenge? Does he understand that how this person hurt me and how hard it is for me to forgive them? And it was so personal. Does he really understand that? You know, I've said before that coming here to Ottawa, 32 years as a Christian, it is by far the biggest faith move that we have made in our lives. Life was good where it was. But we have to answer that question, what does love require of us? And there were moments as we were contemplating and praying and consulting does God really understand my situation? Is he really going to be able to take care of what we think our needs are? Really? Does he really understand all the intricacies of that I'm going through in my life? And if you're anything like me, there are some battles we think, oh yeah, God, God's got this. There are some other ones that is so difficult. Does God really understand my need 
to get married. Does God understand my need to raise my children with an understanding of who he is? Does God understand my, sometimes my addiction, be it to drinking or pornography? Does he really understand how hard this is? Or whatever challenge you may be going through, does God really understand how challenging it is to put my trust in someone that I can't touch? And so this morning, and for the next few weeks as we examine this God, and to realize He is not like us, and sometimes we try to do that, and we look at ourselves and our fallibility and our imperfections and we think maybe God is like this somewhere, somehow. But the scripture reminds us, man, we worship a God that does not need any instruction. There's no gaps in his learning. He's all sufficient. We continue, and we, we turn to the next slide, if we can turn there, Alex, in verse 25, it says this, we have that up there, it's a, 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 actually it's verse 17 is good, all the nations are insignificant before him. They are regarded as absolutely nothing. To whom can you compare God? To what image can you liken him? You know, uh, in this day and age, our world is a very interesting place with relationships between countries. Depends who you talk to, we have a complete and utter different perspective. The Bible says, these nations really are nothing before God in terms of its significance from this perspective. It does not overwhelm God. You know, one of the great things I love to do when I fly, I, I have a chance to look down and there are no borders. Uh, you, you can't tell which town separates which town, which province separates which province, and at times you can't tell, tell which country separates what country. Yeah, our God says, you can't compare me to anyone. In verse 25, we look and we see what the scripture says about who our God is. It says, to whom can you compare me? Whom do I resemble, says the Holy One. Look up to the sky. Who created all these heavenly lights? He is the one who leads out of their ranks, calls them all by name because of his absolute power and awesome strength. Not one of them is missing. There are a lot of times in verse 28, but we'll, uh, we'll close this section and we'll understand that God actually in all the billions and billions and billions and billions of stars, he hasn't lost track of any of them. Sometimes I can't find my keys. <laughs> <laughs> that I just had three minutes ago. When I've got to do sometimes my income tax, I can't find the, 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 the receipts that I need. And I know I left it in this drawer. Who moved it? Because <laughs> it's never my fault, right? Yet what the scripture says, in all 
the challenges in all the stars in the in the heavenly realms God does not lose track of them you know what the Bible says as well God does not lose track of who we are you know sometimes we think boy has God forgotten me That's why sometimes I think, sometimes in, when we pray to God, we pray the same prayer so often we think, maybe God forgot that I, that I talked to him about this. And we treat God like we treat other people. I need to remind you, can you bring this please? Can you get this for me? Can you help me out with this? And not want, we send a text, we send an email, we call, we uh, whatever forms of community. We Instagram, we Facebook, whatever, we Twitter. We say, can you do this? And sometimes we think that God is like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God. In, it shows our persistence. There's a concept about that in the scriptures where we ask over and over. But sometimes, uh, do we ask because we think God has forgotten? That he's lost track of his relationship with me? The Bible tells us that there's not a hair on our head that is love that he's not aware of. For some, that's easier than others. Yes, I'm talking to you, Chris. <laughs> and it's getting easier and easier on my head, but uh, that's another discussion for another time. You know, God is just really incomparable in that sense. So I came to, uh, I've been downtown, uh, at least in this area of, of Ottawa, and we were getting together with Rob and Danielle uh, earlier this week. And so I, I, I'm, I'm going to have a time of confession here. Um, so I drive into on York Street there, right? And York Street, uh, nice little area there, you know. Uh, and um, and so I said to Danielle, I said, "Man, there's a nice little community there. Really, really nice. This Awato community." <laughs> and she looked at me, and she's laughing uncontrollably. And she was not la laughing with me. She was absolutely laughing at me. <laughs> Hurt my feelings, still does. I gotta get through it. But what happened was, of course, if you know that area at all, it's Ottawa backwards. But when you look at it from that direction, it's Awato. That's what it says. It seemed like a so I thought it was a really nice community. And nice little shops, and that shows my ignorance. And and I generally. Um, would, uh, would not necessarily um, look and sound that dumb. <laughs> I said generally. But it was, it was quite remarkable. And, and you realize how, man, how short you fall in understanding of things or how you can lose track. And sometimes what I do, I try to superimpose how I think on God. And what God says ultimately, I don't resemble anyone. There's nothing for you to liken me to. He's that far above us. And today, we love to shape God the way that we would like for him to be. It's called humanism, right? What we, what we do is that we create God. And if we don't like this aspect of him, we actually, what? Okay, all right. Um, owner of a red Hyundai license plate CHHM 404 need to move your car so that we can someone can get out that's not us oh great sorry <laughs> sorry about that we call them out just like that in front of everyone <laughs> That is so, see, if he was like God, he'd know that he didn't have to, he couldn't park there. <laughs> no, but oftentimes what we do is that we liken God to our thinking and we shape God. This aspect of God, I don't like. And so I'm going to cut this aspect of God out. This one I like, so I'm going to elevate and I'm going to highlight and I'm going to embolden that this is what God is like and what the scripture tells us over and over and over again. 
there is no comparison. Now, how do we reconcile that we're made in the image of God? We're made in the image of God. There are aspects of God that is in us, but God's made, made in our image. Let's not confuse the two. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. We're going to read some scriptures and we're going to see this nature of God. And so, and so the idea, guys, of what we're trying to do here for the next few weeks is to be able to look at some things about who God is, take ourselves, our eyes off of ourselves. There are some times we need to take that break and look to God and say, you know what, I need to recalibrate what I focus on. So Job, we know the story about Job. Job had some issues and he had some friends, uh, so-called friends, uh, who were trying to help him out. And to put it mildly, they weren't doing a very good job. What happened with Job? He lost his family, he lost all his possessions. I mean, he was a test case, if you would, for testing. Are we still going to remain faithful to God? And I don't know where you are in your walk with God. Maybe you're saying this Sunday is the last time I'm coming because I'm barely hanging on. Maybe it's your first time and you say, I don't know if I'm going to, somebody drag me here and I don't know if I'm going to come back, but okay, I'm going to give it a try. And I don't know where you are in that journey. Maybe you have given yourself to God and, it, and you, from your vantage point, it's all for naught. Look where I am today. I've given my life to God and it's not what I envisioned. It's not even nearly what I envisioned. I'm sure when Job got married and had his kids and accumulated all his wealth, he didn't envision losing them. He didn't envision uh, getting sick himself. He didn't envision losing everything. And Job was struggling in his faith, and this is how God tried to help him out to get his faith where it needed to be. He says, who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, dude, you don't even know what you're talking about. You see a myopic view of what's going on in the world, and now you have concluded who I am, what I am, and how I do things? Who is this? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Um, I got a few questions for you, Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? These are some rhetorical questions. Job didn't necessarily need to answer him. He's trying to help him to understand. Job, I got this. To the next scripture. Next slide, please. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Uh, uh, Job, let me ask you a couple of questions. Have you ever gone to places in the earth the deep, deep places. Do you know what it's like there? Do you understand how this all, entire universe works? Do you understand how gravity works and how it helps with the tides and the moon and how the sun all works and how one place is warm and one place is cold? You don't understand? Do you understand how that all works? then shut it. Stop whining and complaining. I 
I've had a chance to go to a number of countries in the world. And I say this not because I'm living here now and not because I'm a Canadian. Canada is the greatest country in the world. And I lived in the States for 17 years, the last 17. I remember at one time in a magazine I, I read when I was flying on Air Canada, and it says, Canadians complain a lot. And what the government should do, should give anyone, everyone a all expense paid vacation to anywhere they would like in the world. And in that way, they'll be more grateful and realize this is the blessed place in the world. We live in the greatest nation, and yet we find things to complain about. I'm talking, man, so I, I'm renting a car, it's almost a brand new car, and I see it says on it, there needs to be an oil change. I'm complaining about why aren't these people on top of their car and knowing how it all works? When the shower is not heating up quick enough. How ridiculous does that sound? Or I've got a stand. I, I, I go to Food Basics or Costco or what have you, and I, I mean, it's like heaven on earth for uh, most of the people in this world, and I'm complaining how long I have to stand in the line. We are created to complain. <laughs> What's who we are? And especially if someone on the phone didn't treat at Rogers or a Bell. And we laugh at those. And yet there are times in our lives we who have been gathered in by this amazing God, and we complain. Some are thinking that God has lost control. Has he forgotten about me? God has never lost control. Guys, even when his son was dying on the cross, it was the time to feel that he has lost control ultimately. And he never lost control. As a matter of fact, it was his greatest mo act in all the world in that it provided salvation for all of us. How do you know what you're going through is not a prelude to God performing a great act in your life? How do you know? We go to Job. We'll close here. In Job 42, we'll skip through some of this. In Job 42, it says this. This after all the conclusion of the matter, right? Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know, Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the air, and now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And so Job, his idea, he's saying, okay, God, I get it. Just leave me alone. We go to the next, we go to the next section here. Is that it? Is that all you have? Okay. Job's idea was that he said, listen, I have now understood what you're saying. I am going to repent in dust and ashes. He says, listen, I understand. I didn't know what I was talking about. And so the idea, as we are embarking on this journey, Ottawa Church, 
is that we take our eyes off of what we can do or what somebody else can do and ultimately what our God in heaven can do. I got together, yes, Lemele and I got together with the communications team, appreciate them so much, appreciate the hearts of the disciples in this church who are just willing to serve. And one of the things that we talked about yesterday, I said, we want to be able to form a basis while we we're small so that when we get to 200, 500, 1,000 disciples, here we will have the basis all, and the foundation all set up. It is not our goal that we remain this small of a congregation because we want to tell about this great God. We want to talk about who this great God is. And so we have found him. And Job's response when he realized how incredible God was, he said, I surrender to you, God. God is so incomparable. There are three aspects I think we know about God is he's that he's omnipotent, meaning God is all powerful. He's omniscient. He knows all. And he's omnipresent. He is everywhere at the same time. I mean, those concepts are so blow away. We, some of them we can, we can grasp a little bit. Power, okay, sometimes we get a little power. We can understand that a little bit. But to be everywhere at the same time? These aspects of God tells us, listen, my little gripe, my little car not starting, my little wave that I put on, my little hair that I'm losing, my little pimple that's coming up, whatever it is, okay? And sometimes there's real legitimate issues like, hey, I'm having difficulty by marriage, or I have an addiction I cannot shake. God says, come. Come. We can figure this out together. Amen. We will continue in this journey and to take our eyes off ourselves and focus on our God for the next little while. Amen? Amen. At this time, what we're going to be doing... Um, uh, as is our custom, we will collect our weekly contribution. And so I'm going to go ahead and ask the ushers to come on up. We'll give thanks. And, and, and if you're visiting with us uh, and you want to participate in this, that's great. But this is generally for the members of the congregation. Uh, it's uh, the way we honor God uh, by our weekly giving. Let's go ahead and give thanks to our God. And, um, but like I said, if you're visiting, feel free not to participate in this part. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that we can uh, pray to you, a God who is incomparable. Father, we know you do not need our money. Father, it's an opportunity to be like your son, who not only forgive, but also give. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.